thank you so much for the invitation to talk today. Um, and yes, as mentioned, I'd like to talk a little bit about the opportunity funds that we've been awarded, um, as well as our research that's ongoing in our lab. So we all know that bladder dysfunction, my slides are not advancing. Uh, sorry, one moment. Why aren't my slides advancing? There we go. Okay, so we all know that LUTs are pervasive and there are, are many different LUTs that we're interested in. We use rodent models and while not 100% ideal, um, we can mimic some of the things that we see pervasive in the human population. Um, we're especially interested in phenotypes of increased frequency, um, urgency, hesitancy, dribbling, things like this, um, because they're things that we see in some of our mouse models. And we also all know that um, LUTs can affect all ages. While they're common in the aging population, like we, we've just been talking about, um, there's also a subset that are present in children. Um, and this is especially prevalent in children with neurodevelopmental disorders, such as autism. Um, and this is kind of an underdeveloped uh, field of study, and it's something that we are also interested in, um, especially because of some of the links with the environmental chemicals I study and their ability to alter the brain. So when we're trying to think about all of the factors that can contribute to LUTs, we know that there's genetics and comorbidities um, that, that people have talked about today, um, but I'm especially interested in the environmental side. What are some of the things that we're exposed to in development and throughout our lives that could potentially be contributing to LUTs on their own or in combination with genetics and those aging comorbidities that you just heard about? Um, so as a starting point of this, our lab is interested in the environmental contaminant um, polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs. So these chemicals are man-made compounds. There's around 209 different congeners and they were originally made because they're excellent insulators. So they're chemically stable, they can dissipate heat. So for that reason, they were found in transformers, they're found in caulking, they're found in paint materials. So lots of building products, lots of industrial products. Um, and uses for them. As I've mentioned, there's 209 of these congeners and not everyone looks alike. So one of the challenges we have with these environmental exposures is to mimic what humans are exposed to, but knowing that not every PCB is identical and not every PCB is the same. So just broadly, they're classified based upon their shape. Um, some are more of a flat planar um, orientation and those are considered dioxin-like because they look like the molecule dioxin and therefore they also antagonize um, receptors like the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Now other PCBs are considered non-dioxin-like and they have a non-coplanar structure. These are the ones that we're typically concerned about when we talk about neurodevelopment and changes to the central nervous system. These PCBs have also been linked to um, as risk factors for autism and neurodevelopmental disorders as well because of their ability to alter um, dendrite morphology in the brain and in rodent models. Um, but these PCBs also target other receptors, so thyroid hormone, ryanidine receptors, um, as well as estrogen and androgen receptors have all been targets. So you can imagine we have this complex mixture. They have different receptor targets based upon their um, prevalence in the body. So it can get very complicated very quickly um, in determining what some of these mechanisms and targets are. So PCBs um, were banned in the United States in the 1970s. And this primarily was due to health concerns, uh, mostly cancer risk. Um, but there were also other health conditions that were linked to PCB exposures, especially um, in industrial workers and things like that. Um, but despite that ban, the PCBs persist in the environment. So in the environment, um, they can leach from waste sites, just present in old building materials. They're present in the water, the sediment, the soil, the air, and they have very, very long half-lives. They're very resistant to degradation on their own. And on top of that, we also have some contemporary sources that we are unintentionally producing today. Um, so as I mentioned, those legacy sources are usually old buildings or things that were made prior to that 1970s ban that are still in the environment, the PCBs that are still present in the soil and the water, um, things like that that can leach out and still be present. 
But the contemporary sources today are concerning because they are produced as unintentional byproducts of some processes that require chlorination. Um, so for example, paint pigment production is one of the major sources of these unintentional sources. The other concern with this is that some of these contemporary PCBs were not necessarily made and put into the electrical transformers and some of those older products. So we don't necessarily understand their health effects quite as well as we actually do of some of those older legacy um, PCB congeners that have been around much longer and that we've studied much longer. Um, so this is why PCBs are still considered a health concern today. Our primary routes of exposure are through inhalation. Again, old, old building materials uh, was a primary source, so those can still be around today. And then primarily through the diet. So these chemicals, once they're ingested, are highly lipophilic. They tend to bioaccumulate. Um, they're not rapidly metabolized, um, so therefore they can bioaccumulate up the food chain. And then our primary sources are usually through meat and dairy, as well as fish. So while we know that there are several health outcomes um, that have been linked to PCB exposures, their effects on lower urinary tract symptoms have never been examined. So, so that's the focus of this study within our laboratory right now. Um, so my graduate students, Connor and Monica, have been working on this project along with my technician, Audrey. And what we're able to do is take wild type C57 female mice, and we dose them with a mixture of PCBs um, that we term this, it's the marbles PCB mixture. Um, so the idea behind this is that these are the top 12 PCB congeners that are found in the serum of a contemporary cohort of women. And these women are at risk of having a child with autism. So not only does it mimic today's levels within the human population, um, but it also kind of mimics um, what might be happening in terms of neurodevelopment in, in those that might be a little bit more um, on the level of a risk factor for um, effects in the brain. And the proportion listed here is the proportion that um, is found in the human serum. So trying to measure environmentally relevant levels in our mouse models. So these female mice are exposed to three different concentrations of this PCB mixture for two weeks prior to mating, and then all through gestation and lactation. So we are interested in the offspring. So once the animals are weaned at postnatal day 21, that is their last day of lactational exposure. And then we allow them to grow up and we are assessing voiding function when those offspring reach around six weeks of age and around 12 weeks of age. Um, and we've done some congener studies that dosing the dams in this manner results in PCB levels in the offspring tissues that are within the realm of what we can see in human tissues. So that's kind of where those doses have been chosen. So in order to look at voiding function, um, we take advantage of the rodent urinary function testing core facility that's here at UW-Madison. Um, I'm a director of this core, so please reach out if you're interested in um, using any of these assays in your animal models. But we've been using it for these studies. And the first one that we assess is void spot assay. So that's allowing mice to urinate on filter paper that we can then image with the UV light and determine the size, the area, um, the different spot sizes of, of urine that mice are able to put out in a cumulative four hour period. So when we take our uh, PCB exposures and we look at the offspring at around six weeks of age, we definitely have some effects of PCBs. And in general, um, these graphs down here are showing spot sizes on the x-axis and then the number of spots of those different sizes. So among the smallest number of urine spots, um, we see a significant increase with PCB exposure in male mice, especially at the low and high concentration. And we see that same phenotype in female mice. So overall, PCBs are increasing the number of very small urine spots that mice produce. So in thinking how this could happen, um, we need a way to examine an individual urine event. So is this kind of just a cumulative small void or is it just multiple voids um, that are just done more frequently? Uh, we can't really assess that by BSA alone. Um, so we take advantage of uroflometry. 
So this places the animal on a grid. The urine can fall through on a scale that's captured by a video so we can see in real time what the void actually looks like. So when we see these VSA results of having very small spots, um, we wanna know what, what some of that voiding looks like in real time. And in the male mice at the lowest concentrations, we see that there's a decrease in the stream ability of, uh, of the urine to come out. So we assign this stream rating from zero to three. Three would be a very strong stream where you can't even make out individual droplets. And then um, lower numbers are voids that consist of mostly drops or a drop in a little bit of stream. So for the males, at least, the Euroflow does confirm um, the VSA results and that those small spots are likely occurring as single droplets of um, urine coming out in a single void. Um, however, we don't see that phenotype in the females. Um, so there might be other explanations as to why they have more small urine spots. And to assess that, we also take a look at anesthetized cystometry. So with both VSA and Euroflow, the am animals are freely moving about those enclosures, they're awake. Um, we know that there's a behavioral component of voiding. So there could be just you know, marking of territory, there could um, be differences that way and just marking their new environment. Um, so with anesthetized cystometry, we take uh, some of those aspects out in that they're anesthetized. However, they can still respond to filling of the bladder with normal contractions and we can fill the bladder at a constant rate and determine the time between the voids. So using systometry, we also found several PCB effects on voiding function. Um, so I'll start here with the females. So one of the first things we look at is intervoid interval. So that's the time between each void. And compared to the controls, the low and high PCB concentrations decrease the amount of time between each void. So these animals void more frequently. Um, and that again is a consistent phenotype with the more small spots that we've seen in the females. In the males, we have a completely different story and we actually see changes in pressure. So this is just the um, maximum pressure that's elicited during a voiding um, event. And in the low and the medium PCB concentrations, this is significantly higher contraction compared to controls. Um, and over on the right-hand side, you can see the system metrograms and that those peaks are much higher um, than the control animal on the top right. So we definitely have some differences in um, the ability of the bladder to contract and void. Um, we further want to assess whether this is kind of at the level of the animal, is it at the level of the bladder, um, and to kind of tease those things apart, we can also take advantage of bladder um, bath assays. So this allows us to take the bladder out of the animal and then we can assess contractility in a controlled environment where we can apply different agonists or antagonists of the contractile pathways. Um, so we're especially interested in this because we saw the females had decreased intervoid intervals. So perhaps the muscle can just contract um, at a faster rate in response to stimuli. Um, and at the same time, we saw the males had higher um, peak maximum contractions, and we want to determine if that is actually um, present in a muscle strip on its own, or is that coming centrally? Um, so we can start to determine some of those things by looking at these bladder bath assays. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these pathways, but you can get the idea that within that controlled ex vivo bladder bath environment, we can have different agonists and antagonists of all of these different pathways that are all important in one way or another um, for normal bladder contraction, both in the normal state as well in the disease state. Um, so we are looking into all of these things, but I'm just gonna show one very simple um, endpoint, and that is stimulating the bladder preps with electrical field stimulation. Um, so, all we are asking in these graphs is with each individual PCB concentration, does the bladder respond um, and elicit a contraction above baseline at a frequency that is higher or lower than the controls? So in the males and what's indicated by the green bars is that the, all of the PCB concentrations um, 
elicited bladder contractions at a lower um, electrical field stimulation than controls. So these bladders may be more sensitive to electrical field stimulation. We saw either no effect or actually a little bit um, more resistant bladders in the female. So we don't think that responsiveness to electrical field stimulation is elicited in some of the female phenotypes that we were seeing with the voiding function, both in BSA and with cystometry. Um, however, sensitivity to um, electrical field stimulation and, and nerve signaling within the bladder might explain some of the small spot phenotypes we saw in the males with BSA, um, as well as the strength of contractions in cystometry. So very complex differences. Um, this is very complex, don't, don't worry about it. But basically this is just showing all of the different endpoints that we can look at with all of the physiology experiments. The bladder bath isn't on here, but um, we obviously just saw differences between males and females there too. Um, but the takeaway is that the blue arrows are things that are happening in the males, pink arrows are things that are happening in females. The direction is the direction of the change. And the major takeaway is that the most of our phenotypes are happening at the low and high concentrations. That's not unsurprising. PCBs tend to do that in um, different endpoints as well. Um, we're looking into the mechanisms that could be underlying some of those things. Um, but then it's also interesting to see that males and females don't necessarily respond the same. Um, so lots of things we can be looking at in terms of mechanism. Um, that, and that's something that I'm, I'm gonna show you coming up here um, of one of them that we're gonna focus on. So overall, males, we see small spots and we have changes in pressure. Females, we get small spots, but a little bit more in terms of the changes in frequency because we're seeing um, changes in inner void interval. So what we're looking into, um, obviously prostate enlargement, um, you know, things we're talking about today in terms of obstruction, we are looking into those phenotypes in these animals. Um, so far, there's minimal effects that we've observed in the prostate of the male mice. Um, so we don't think that this can explain 100% um, of like an obstruction type of phenotype. And it certainly can explain the females because we don't, um, don't have prostate in the females. We're looking at bladder innervation and sensation, um, especially because those bladder strips were able to respond differently to um, contractile stimuli. So we're looking at the level of the bladder itself and in innervation. We're also really interested in bladder inflammation because these chemicals have been known to cause um, increased inflammatory cytokines in the brain as well as the serum. Um, so we're wondering if something there might be going on in the bladder as well. And we, we have a project to look at that. But the focus for today is the central nervous system. So could this be contributing to the, some of the phenotypes that we're seeing? Kim, you're gonna have to uh, finish up now, okay? A couple yep, of minutes. So um, basically we're looking at the level of the dendrites. So we know that PCBs can alter dendrite morphology and we're looking in our animals. We know that they can, the same mixture we use that I just showed you to alter voiding function, um, those same chemicals and the same concentrations increase dendrite complexity in um, the offspring. So our O'Brien Center Opportunity Pool is to investigate this. And it's in collaboration with um, Harvard and Dr. Verstegen, as well as Mike Cahill here at UW. And this project is still in the works. We, we don't have results from it yet, but this is the planned study. So dosing the animals, we're gonna then inject a G-camp, um, cremediated G-camp into the region of the brain that controls voiding function. We're gonna send the mice to Harvard and they're gonna do awake cystometry while recording the G-CAMP signaling in the brain. So we're hypothesizing that these PCBs are causing changes to um, the neurons within the pontine micturition center um, because we know PCBs can cause changes to other neurons within the brain. Um, and we think that this might be underlying a subset of our voiding symptoms. Um, and we did one trial injection so far, that's it. <laughs> um, so I will end there and thank my lab, um, as well as our funding from our O'Brien Center and happy to answer any questions.